In our last lesson, we learned that in our baptism, we were circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. The power of the old nature was neutralized as it was separated from our essential persons. Now we are able in Christ Jesus to dominate the sinful nature, to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God, to deny ungodliness and lusts that war against the soul. It's a glad message that we have indeed for those that have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Now in him sin no more has dominion over you. You have dominion over it and can successfully resist the devil. Let us praise the Lord for that glorious benefit. Now today we want to associate your baptism with the death of Jesus Christ, one of the very central considerations in Scripture. I continue to be amazed at the associations that the Holy Spirit makes with baptism, how radically different they are from, what, from much that is heard today. Think of some of the things we have learned thus far, that your salvation has been connected to your baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved that the great benefit of the remission of sins is associated with your baptism. You're baptized for the remission of sins. That the washing that is necessary for you to be clean in God's sight is related to your baptism. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And the removal of the law as a condemner of men has taken place when you are baptized. What a wonderful thing is associated with being baptized into Christ Jesus. Every single benefit is central, pivotal, critical. None of them are incidental, thereby attaching great significance to your baptism. Now as we focus upon the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and your identification with his death, we want to read from Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. <clears throat> now in the word of God, the death of Christ is a pillar upon which redemption is built. No one who knows the Word of God considers the death of Christ insignificant or incidental. It is absolutely central in Scripture. I want to take a few moments here to refresh your mind about the associations made with Christ's death by the Holy Spirit of God. You must think of Christ's death in connection with these things. Romans, the fifth chapter and verse 10, proclaims to us that we have been reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Reconciliation is the conversion of an enemy to a friend. We have been brought to a point where we see things like God sees things. We're reconciled to God. We see Christ like God sees him and are well pleased with him. We see the world like God sees the world and thus crucify it and refuse to become absorbed into its order, knowing that its fashion passes away. We see ourselves as God sees us and thus set about to purify ourselves and cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. We have been reconciled to God by the death of his son. His son took the personal responsibility for your sin. And when he did, God separated your sin from you and reconciled you unto himself. You are welcome in God's presence as a baptized believer. In the book of Colossians, the first chapter, verses 21 and 22, this fact of reconciliation is once again tied with Christ's death. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In the world to come, in the day of judgment. Those that are in Christ Jesus will be presented to God without blame, unreprovable in his sight, absolutely holy. Until that time, by faith, you are holy and unblameable in God's sight right now. And it has all occurred because of your association with the death of Christ. 
When God thinks of Christ's death, he thinks of man being reconciled and brought back to him. Jesus, commenting upon his death, actually before he died, spoke a most wonderful truth in John the 12th chapter. I find a great deal of consolation as I read this. It is a challenging concept. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus was alone when he was in the world, the only righteous man, the only godly man, the only one that obeyed God perfectly, the only man that was thoroughly pleasing to God. But Jesus had such an interest in mankind, such a fervent love, for the race of man, the fallen race of man, that he did not want to abide alone. So he spoke in this parable in John 12, 24, that a seed remains alone unless it falls into the ground and dies. But if it falls in the ground and dies, it'll bring forth much fruit and will no longer be alone. Jesus' death was when he fell, so to speak, into the ground, and when he died. But when Jesus arose and emerged from the grave, and ascended up on high and led captivity captive, he no more remains alone. A great host has been joined to him because he died. Now the Apostle Paul proclaimed this in unusual ways in Galatians, the third chapter. In verse 16 of this chapter, he identifies Jesus Christ as the seed or offspring of Abraham to whom all the promises were made. Now to Abraham and his seed, were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now follow me closely. In the 27th verse of this same chapter, we are told that if we are baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. And to those that are baptized into Christ, this remarkable word is stated in verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, and you that are baptized into him are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In other words, Jesus is no longer alone. You joined to him are Abraham's seed also, and all the wonderful promises of God for benefit and blessings are yours. He has brought forth fruit to God. The death of Christ is also associated with being justified before God. In Romans in the fifth chapter, in verse 9, the apostle proclaims that we are justified by the death of God's Son. Justified does not mean we're just acquitted of our sin. He actually put sin away by the sacrifice of himself and made us guiltless in God's sight. God, as he searches you that are in Christ Jesus, can behold no sin in you. Oh, I know technically that you have sinned. I understand that. I understand that we come short of the glory of God and must daily confess our sins and plead with our Father to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But in Christ, there is no sin. And if you are in Christ, you are justified, free from sin and qualified for intimate fellowship with the living God. You have been separated from your sins by the death of Christ. In Christ's death, God made him to become sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 proclaims this in an astounding verse that boggles the mind. And he was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here are two great transmittals that take place in the death of Christ. In Christ's death, your sins and the responsibility and punishment for them were transmitted to Christ. But Christ's righteousness, the very righteousness of God in his death was transmitted to you. And as you were baptized into his death, you became a participator in the righteousness of God. Your ability to do the things of God may come short of what you desire, but you still in Jesus have the mind of God and have been made the righteousness of God in him by his death. In his death, the Lord Jesus Christ put away sin. Now, the point we are making here that I don't want you to miss is that Christ's death is of such centrality in Scripture. It's such a central issue. Once in the end of the world, 
Hebrews 9, 26 tells us, He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, if Jesus died or sacrificed himself, sin has been put away. That's what Jesus came to do, and that's what he did. He, Hebrews 1, 3 proclaims, by himself purged our sins. He took them away from the face of the living God. He brought them to a place where God is no longer cognizant of, it, of them, where God can see you above your sin. What a glorious reality is associated with the death of Christ. Can we forget this great occurrence that it took place at Christ's death? In Hebrews, the second chapter, in verse 14, a remarkable statement that by his death, Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil has been destroyed, frustrated, cast down, and overthrown by the death of Christ. If Jesus died, and he did, Satan has been destroyed. That's the proclamation of Scripture. It may not seem like he is, that's only because he does, he's a deceiver. Satan's intents for you have been frustrated by the death of Christ. You have been baptized into his death and thus have gained the victory over the evil one. The word of God also says that we have peace through the blood of the cross, the death of Christ's son. So you see in these varied texts that the death of Christ is associated with great occurrences, things that would stagger the mind of prophets and bards of old. They were not able to conceive of the benefits you have in Christ Jesus. Now, the Word of God tells us that you have been baptized into Christ's death. Turning again to our text in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and four, let's rehearse this and see if we can derive something that will bolster your confidence in Christ Jesus. Do you not know this, the apostle writes, and I ask you, do you know this? Do you know that so many of us, that is, all of us that have submitted to this. So many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We were immersed into this very death we've been talking about. This death that reconciled men unto God. This death that brought peace. This death that destroyed the devil. This death that brought justification. We have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him. He went there with us. With him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. The benefits of death, the death of Christ, cannot be experienced unless they're perceived. It will do you no experiential good to know that these benefits exist in Christ's death if you can't connect your baptism, your own personal experience, with Christ's death. You were baptized into Christ's death. Now, God thinks highly of Christ's death. It seems trite to even say that. When God sees Christ's death, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, he saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. The debt that you owed God because of your involvement in sin has been completely paid. The debt has been completely liquidated. And you were baptized into the death that God honors as a basis for that forgiveness. Your baptism is the point of identification. Now, Romans, the eighth chapter in verse 10, commenting on our body, says this. Your body, you know, is what is buried with Christ in baptism. The body is dead because of sin. That is to say, the body, and when the Word of God talks about your body, it means more than just your external members. It means everything that goes along with it. The mind of the flesh, the Adamic nature, as it's called theologically, every part of you that's not regenerated, every part of you that's not born again, every part of you that's not invested with the life of God is dead. It's unrecognized by God. God doesn't honor it. It's cut off from God. 
It's unreceptive to God, unable to hear God, unable to please God. The body is dead because of sin. And because it's dead, we bury it in baptism. We renounce its dominance in baptism. When you were brought under that watery wave and buried beneath the water with Christ Jesus, you were saying to those that saw it, and to angels, and to God the Father, and to Jesus Christ himself, Father, Lord, people, I repudiate the dominance of this body. I now renounce the sinful desires of the body. I lay it to rest here. I bury it, and I'm going to rise to walk in newness of life. My spirit is going to dominate me, not my body, not fleshly lusts, but spiritual yearnings with my heart. I'm going to love God with every part of my being. The body being dead, it made perfect sense to bury it. What is a burial? You know, burial is part of the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, this much neglected part of the gospel is preached. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose the third day again according to the scriptures. In his burial, Jesus Christ took away the sins of the world. The word of God tells us he even preached during that interim period of time. He was cut off from God. He arose from the grave victorious after a burial. The burial stood between the death and the resurrection. Your burial stood between your death, your death to sin, your death to the world, and your life to God. What a glorious thought. The means of burial, and it's clear, let's say it again, we were buried with Christ by baptism into death. That's where you were buried. That's where you renounced the sinful nature. That's where you renounced the dominance of the flesh. That's where you assumed an identity with Jesus Christ and his death. Objectively, <clears throat> Your identity with Christ's death achieves this. When you were buried with Christ into his death, you personally became identified with Christ's death, and all of the benefits that we proclaimed in Christ's death passed to you. The reconciliation became yours. The justification became yours. The peace of God became yours. The separation from sin became yours. The destruction of the devil became your benefit. Baptized into his death, all of the benefits of Christ's death that saturate the word of God, the subject of apostolic doctrine over and over in every epistle, the death of Christ, when you're baptized into his death and you read those benefits, they're yours. They have passed to you. Let your confidence be strong. Be bold in your assurance before God. God who cannot lie has associated your baptism with the death of his son. Subjectively, or that is from the experiential viewpoint, when you are baptized into Christ's death, the world lost its attractiveness to you. You were crucified to the world and the world to you. It looked different now when you came out of that watery grave there was a brighter day, one the world couldn't give you. And in this fresh vision and awareness that the world is passing away and the lusts thereof, and as the book of 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter puts it, the fashion of this world passeth away. You came up and seen everything new. Everything became new to you. You began to be resolved. I will deny ungodliness. I'm going to please my God. I'm going to absorb the word of God. I'm going to submit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ because I see the world is vain just like God said it was. He said the world passeth away and the lusts thereof and I see it now. I see the truth of it. It makes sense to me now. Why? Because you were baptized into Christ's death where the world was repudiated by the living God. You see... Baptism is not an empty ceremony. You are crucified with Christ in your baptism. That's what Romans, the sixth chapter and verse six proclaims. 
and it's referring to your baptism, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The old man in Scripture is the part of you that's ungodly. It's the part of you that draws you away from God. It's the part of you that are, is unregenerate. See, every child of God is a spiritual schizophrenic. He has two natures. One is called in Scripture old because it's gradually dying away. The other is new. It's the very divine nature that's been given unto you. Now your old man is crucified with Christ and buried with him. Why? So that you would not serve sin. Now if you've had trouble, fellow believer, maybe you've just come into Christ, maybe you've been in him for a while. If you've had trouble living for God, let me assure you that if you can see this truth that I'm proclaiming, and it is the truth, you can be victorious over the sin that so easily besets you. You can fulfill the mandate of Scripture in Hebrews 12, verse 2, and you can cast off the sin and weight which does so easily beset you, knowing that you've been baptized into Christ's death. Now let's look at the results of this death with Christ Jesus. <clears throat> to think, I have died with Christ, been buried with him by baptism into death. In my burial is where life began. Except a seed fall into the ground and die, Jesus said, it abideth alone. You in your baptism cast your life into the ground and let it die. You said, Father, I'm willing to be second. I'm willing to place my life in the background like my Lord Jesus did. I'm willing to deny myself. I see the sense of what you've said, that you are the preeminent one. I'm willing to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and to repudiate the world. And I'm going to, in my act of baptism, I'm going to confess that before men and angels. I'm denying myself now and dying to the world. And when you did that, you contacted divine life. Divine life was the result. Now this is proclaimed in Romans, the sixth chapter. You not only died to the world, you became alive unto God. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Verse 4 of Romans 6. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Now, your faith must lay hold of this. It must grasp this. If it's true that you died with Christ, the word of God says you're alive with him too. If you were buried with him, you were raised with him. If planted with him in the likeness of his death, you were raised in your baptism. You were raised in the likeness of his resurrection. You have the capacity to be receptive to God, but you must use it. You must respond to his word in hope and in faith and in anticipation. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. Romans 6 and verse 12. Reckon is a scriptural word which means reason like this. God says you're dead to sin. Now you reason after this manner. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead in Christ to sin. I am going to pay attention to the part of me that's alive to God, not the part that's inclined to sin. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. You've been buried into Christ's death. Now your commission from the living God is this. It's found in Romans, the sixth chapter in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let it. Don't tell anyone you can't help but sin. Don't tell anyone you was too weak. This is the God of heaven speaking. 
speaking through the Holy Spirit to your heart. You died with Christ in your baptism. You're dead to sin. Now don't let it reign in your mortal body. Don't let it exercise dominance over you. Deny it and refuse it to have expression in your body. As James 1.21 puts it, put off the superfluity of naughtiness. Superfluity is the outgrowth, the expression of a wicked character. You may not be able to stop evil thoughts from coming into your mind, but you can stop them from expressing themselves. It's something like this. The birds may be flying over your head. You can't stop them from landing on top of your head, but you can certainly stop them from building a nest there. And while you may not be able to purge your mind consistently of all contrary thoughts and ambitions, in other words, you will still be tempted, but you deny the temptation. Why? Because you're able in Christ Jesus to do it. This is not Eastern mysticism. This is not mind over matter. This is living in accord with the truth, based upon reality. Now let's review briefly what we have seen. We have seen that Christ's death is consistently pictured as a source of triumph and victory in Scripture. Man's reconciliation is based upon it. His justification is based upon it. Christ having many brethren, a lot of fruit, kindred spirits, is based upon it. The destruction of the devil is founded upon the death of Christ. It occurred when he died, and the peace of God comes through the blood of the cross. Now, you were baptized into that death. You became a benefiter of the death when you were baptized. You procured these wonderful benefits and privileges in your baptism. Now, this is language for faith. It's language for believing. I'm not asking you just to talk yourself into this, but to believe what God's Word has said. Your baptism is your personal proof of involvement with the death of Christ. You must associate it with Christ's death. Don't associate it with obeying a tradition of man, or with a mere form, or with a mere ritual. God does not consider it a ritual. He considers it a very vital transaction in which you were united with the death of His Son. Now, go on your way rejoicing.